Hey, what's up everybody? Dr. Choi here. Um, I got a little bit of time before my next patient, so I'm gonna just sit here and answer some questions on YouTube. So I'm gonna be going over some keep, uh, questions people had in regards to like sinus lifts, grinding, um, gum grafting, people who made some comments in regards to some of our other All On 4 videos, and in general, just answering a lot of questions. And I got a um, pretty juicy comment in regards to, it was definitely coming from a dentist in regards to um, treatment of periodontal disease um, versus doing it all on four. So um, I wanted to go over that in detail and I'll say that for the very end because again, it is, um, I definitely do have a response back to that. So um, first question was, um, I'm confused as there's many mixed reviews and advice on doing a sinus lift and bone graft first um, after an extraction, I'm assuming and let it heal. And then other dentists are saying you can do bone grafting right after the tooth extraction, preparing for the implant surgery all in the same surgery procedure. So confusing. Um, don't you have to let it heal first? So that's a great question. So um, I do want to say that, again, dentistry can be very subjective and the way that everybody does things is completely, can be completely different. Um, I'll tell you that I've done thousands of sinus lifts um, every week I do multiple sinus lifts because I also not only just doing individual implants I do a lot of all on four cases and on those cases um, a lot of times you know let's say 30 40 50 percent of the time I'll also be doing a um, lateral window sinus lift on these patients and so um, I do have a lot of experience doing sinus lifts and in my experience, what I've seen work well is um, as you do more and more sinus lifts you can definitely get more um, aggressive. I don't know if that's necessarily the word in regards to actual number of procedures that you're doing all at the same time. So if you're newer or you're not as experienced at doing sinus lifts or you don't have the predictability when you're doing this type of procedure, um, if um, it may be more predictable for you to do a extraction and bone graft at first and then maybe in the future doing a sinus lift and then waiting like, you know, the necessary five, six months of healing afterwards and then placing the implant. Um, if you have a lot of experience and you feel like you have a lot of good predictability, then you can even take out the tooth, um, do the sinus lift and any necessary bone grafting all at the same time. Now, there's a few other details that come into the equation also of how much native bone you have before you actually hit the, what we call the Schneiderian membrane. Um, whenever you're doing um, an extraction um, and then same time sinus lift. Um, but so there's a little bit of variables that come into the equation, but most of the time you can take out the tooth, do a sinus lift and a bone graft at the same time. Now, I will tell patients that one of the biggest factors that I will have in regards to why I would like to wait is, um, I even saw a patient uh, several days ago seek me for, uh, ask me, uh, um, she traveled in from out of state. She had a question in regards to, she had a procedure done where she had a infected root canal and they took the tooth out and did a simultaneous bone graft socket preservation and sinus lift, um, which I was thinking probably wasn't the best approach because in my experience, I have seen so many issues with failing root canals, which is why I really, really cannot stand root canals sometimes because they can offer a lot of unpredictability with healing um, with any dental procedure, so surgery. So, but anyways, hopefully that can answer your question. Um, but to kind of like sum it up, um, in regards to everybody having a different opinion in regards to like timing and the, you know, whether they're gonna do everything simultaneously, that's gonna be a, um, a subjective answer for a lot of people. And it, it does come down to experience and predictability and also just some other factors that people might, you know, have in regards to like, you know, is there infection present, stuff like that. And uh, the next question, is bruxism or night grinding a contraindication to dental implants? And so um, it can be, right? So I have a patient, we did an all on four on six years ago, who basically just is, um, had a grinding habit, um, even before we did the all on four on him, he, you know, he was 60 years old when he sought treatment with us and he just ground his teeth down to nubs, right? So, um, you know, and he also just recently just tore through all his multi-unit abutments, right? So obviously, you know, grinding can be a contraindication and that that's for a full arch, like all on four type of solution. What about for individual implants? Well, yes, dental implants, 
um, are no different than a post that you put in the ground. And I, I tell people, I was like, uh, what are they called? Like a cattle panel or cattle pole? It's like, um, it's a post that you put in the ground. And um, I had one out in my garden. And, you know, any, like, you know, we have to like basically take physics into account. And so um, dental implants, like, um, they don't mind vertical pressure at all. But the, the horizontal stresses is not, what, is, is not what they like, right? And I'm, I'm using that example, that cattle panel that I was using in my garden. And like, you know, after it had been sitting in the ground for like a season or a year, the best way to remove it is to literally give it horizontal action, eventually like pull it out. Um, and similarly for dental implants, um, dental implants just, you know, do the physics, do not like the horizontal action. So things that we could do are, you know, night guards really um, are nice because it can help redistribute the stress when you put that on. And if you're grinding your teeth sideways, you know, what it can do is it can help redistribute the force so that single implant isn't getting as much force. Um, another solution that patients who are big time clenchers or grinders can do is that they can use something like Botox, right? And so what Botox does is it helps paralyze the muscles. So they say about 80% of the population clenches or grinds their teeth. Um, I personally am a clencher, so I also use Botox every six months. So that's something else that we have in the arsenal that we can use. Um, so um, if you are a clencher or a grinder, it's not necessarily a contraindication to dental implants. But if you do not, you know, use some sort of a appliance to help redistribute those forces or maybe use Botox or lighten the occlusion on that implant, meaning it's so that you're not banging so hard on that crown of that implant, then um, you potentially could have longer term issues with your dental implant. Uh, the next question is talking about bone grafting around a dental implant. So if there is a bone loss, if there is bone loss around an implant, but the implant is still stable, can you add bone graft around an implant or would you have to removing the implant first is a must. So um, what I've been practicing for 14 years. And so um, the, the treatment, and this is the bone loss, anytime you have bone loss around a dental implant, it's what we call periimplantitis. And so, you know, bone loss around a dental implant is just a, it's kind of like the wild west. And so in my years of practice since 2011, I remember like this doctor named Stuart Fromm up in New York City was lecturing a lot about his periimplantitis protocol. And everybody pretty much had an entire protocol, like a, a different protocol. And what we would say is like, you know, literally everybody was throwing everything but the kitchen sink at, at these, you know, at treatment for periimplantitis. And so costs would get very extensive. Like I, I noticed in some of the treatment plans, it was like, wow, it's like more expensive to treat this periimplantitis than it was even to get this implant in the first place, right? But I could see why, because again, the unpredictable nature and the expense of the materials that are being involved with the procedure. Um, and also like, if you were to even say pay the same cost as like removing the implant, I mean, to not have to go through a removal of an implant and then bone grafting and then a placement of an implant and then the abutment crown in the future, saving all that time and money, I mean, at least the time in the appointments, would you know be worth it in itself however the problem with treating periimplantitis is that it is very um un again unpredictable right and even using that same protocol is not going to work on everybody because everybody's body is different and how they heal is different um so long story short over all these years there hasn't been a standard protocol now i have the lanap laser i also have an erbium yag laser and I will tell you personally um, that the best treatment that I feel ha that has been the most promising for me is um, I started noticing at our AAP, so our Academy of Perio conferences um, about five years ago that some doctors out there were using um, the special Erbium YAG laser that was getting awesome results. And like when we would go to these conferences and see some of these results, the results were amazing. Um, so I actually bought one of those about a year and a half ago and have been using it in my practice and I don't see periimplantitis that often, but in the few times that I have and I've treated it, we've had some really awesome results. So um, this laser um, is very promising, but the, the problem also in regards to like how people use this laser, everybody's got different protocols, protocols in regards to like, you know, do they use GEM21? Do they use certain biologics? Do they use, what kind of bone are they using? Like, what's your protocol? Are you using any sort of additional chemicals on the implant to treat the implant surface? So, um, you know, the funny thing is I probably placed about 10 implants on my mother and my father. And actually my dad uh, texted me about a week ago, this implant that we placed years ago. Uh, my mom's actually having some bone loss on one of her implants. So she's going to be here next week. So I'm excited to use this laser on her. And I'll keep you guys updated in regards to that. But um, 
that's just my little you know blurb about like bone loss around dental implants but um if the, so this person's asking if the implant is still stable right so that's that's a good first point the implant can be cannot be mobile if there is any movement at, at all then any sort of treatment of periimplantitis is not going to work um and then this person is asking can you add bone graft around the implant or do you think you're removing the implant so back in the day i would have removed the implant again it is based off of how much bone loss there is right what's the pattern of bone loss you know how many walls do we have remaining still around the implant right because if we have more of a pothole type of defect then i can easily laser that implant surface and bone graft it but if it is a horizontal bone loss and there's no like detain like walls kind of define like defining the area creating a pothole type of effect, then it's going to be a lot harder and more unpredictable to be able to treat an implant like this. And so what, when I, what in essence, everything comes back down to is predictability, right? So if you're investing this money to get this implant um, bone grafted and treated, we want predictability. And so again, like my thoughts in regards to like the best laser out there to do that would be the J. Meridia um, Erbium YAG laser to treat something like this. But even if I was to go ahead and place an individual implant and the patient has like, you know, some bone loss and I'm trying to like rebuild bone, you know, doing something, some sort of guided bone regeneration and like create a tenting effect around the implant, like that's, that's difficult, right? And so like it, it can be done, but the, the, predictability, the predictability of it comes down um, so, um, versus having a nice pothole four wall defect around an implant, what we call a circumferential defect. So to answer this person's question, um, you know, I would say go to someone that has that J. Marita Erbium Yag laser. Um, I know when I ordered it a year and a half ago, I was like the only person in DFW that has that. Um, hopefully it's gaining more in popularity. I've used it. I love it. Um, but also just understand the predictability and na nature of it that whoever you're going to see that who's do whoever's doing this, just make sure that um, it's going to, um, sorry, someone's at that knocked on the door um, lost kind of lost my train of thought but um, just understand that you know removing the implant would be more predictable because you can start from scratch but obviously there's a cost ex uh, associated with that removing the implant is going to be troublesome and you'd have to be starting from scratch um, but I think in the future you're going to see more and more patients that are going to be getting um, this um, laser treatment around the dental implants and we could save a lot more implants versus removing them and let's see, next question. Love your videos. Is it common for a dentist to tell you that they will try to put five to six implants, but give you a price for four implants? When I called, they told me the price is good up to eight, but um, would you put more implants in if you don't, if they didn't price it in? So I think this this response was in um, in aspect, I mean, in reference to like a sinus lift video that I have, uh, lateral versus, um, you know, sinus, uh, vertical sinus lifting. But to answer your question, this looks like it's a question about like all on four, but so all on four is like the reason why it's great bang for your buck, you're not getting in single implants priced out, right? So a lot of people, most people in the, the country are going to price out all on four for a fixed cost, whether you need four implants, six implants. So there was a patient that I was expecting to do on all on six recently, and then this patient ended up getting eight implants, right? And so to answer your question, although we might anticipate like a um, certain, you know, a certain number of implants, when we go in and we start removing your teeth, we see areas that might have infection, some areas that might not be ideal to be placing implants, we have to vary the number of implants that we may be using on a, um, you know, on a case by case basis, even uh, what our initial plan is um, versus like what's actually happening in the patient's mouth. So. Um, I use that as a testament to the fact that, you know, what I've been trying to relay in these videos is that, you know, quite frankly, the, you know, when we were talking about FP1 versus FP3 or like, you know, commonly people know it as three on six versus all on four or implant bridges versus all on four. It's like, you know, FP1s or implant bridges or, you know, three on six, they, they require your implants to be in very precise positions, right? And unfortunately, when you're going through the process of extracting your teeth, and you know, you're dealing and you're seeing infections or whatever's going inside the mouth, plans can change dramatically and very quickly. And I'm telling you this, despite the fact that I've placed thousands of implants in my career. So, um, you know, hopefully that answers your question that we don't know what, you know, we can plan the best we can, but once we get into your mouth, um, that, that can definitely change, right? So 
that's why you'll see package pricing and that why that person was offering you up to a certain amount of implants um, that your price would be good for. And um, next question is, how long do you need to be on a soft diet after a gum graft? And I'd say for a free gingival graft, I'd say about one week. And then after a connective tissue graft, I would say like about a month until they remove the sutures.